medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram COVID-19 update. We haven't done one of these in a while. We want to talk about the BA5 subvariant. What we have here is data from the CDC that's showing the percent viral lineages among infections in the United States from March to July 2nd. And what you can see here is a very precipitous increase in a subvariant known as BA.5. And as of early July, it now represents the majority of infections here in the United States. So is this worth really talking about? Let's take a look here in the last few months. We've seen BA2.121 come and is now going. We've seen BA2 do the same thing. Is this just the next subvariant of Omicron that's going to come and go and really not cause the issues that we thought before? Well, I think what we need to do is look at the data and then make up our mind. The first question is, is how does BA5 relate to the other Omicron subvariants that we've seen already? So to understand that, we look at this antigenic distance of the different SARS-CoV-2 variants. This graph is actually from Eric Topol's Substack, which I've left the link there, and you can go take a look. And he's actually written quite a bit about the subvariant BA5. And what you see here in the middle is the original SARS-CoV-2 virus that was isolated at the very beginning of the pandemic in 2019. And that's known as 614G, one of the very first variants of the virus. What you can see here is an antigenic distance. So you can see, for instance, let's talk about Delta. Delta was sort of in this area here, fairly close, even though there was a significant difference. Well, with Omicron, the first Omicron, you can see this is a much more different subvariant or variant of SARS-CoV-2. And if we were to use the same graph, BA5 would be way out here. This is BA5. And what you need to understand is the majority of these differences are occurring in the spike protein. Remember, the spike protein is that protein that resides on the surface of the virus and interacts with the ACE2 receptor on the surface of the cell that it's going to infect. And so as these proteins on the spike protein change, its ability to infect either goes up or down. Not only that, but also the ability of antibodies that have been formed from previous infections, whether they be previous infections or previous vaccinations, are going to be different if the spike protein has been modified. And this is known as adaptive immunity. This is where proteins are presented to the immune system, and the immune system recognizes them using their immunoglobulins, which are antibodies, or their T cells, things of that nature, which remember specific protein sequences. That's adaptive immunity. Remember that. We're going to talk about that in the future. So because of the Omicron subvariant BA5 being so different from the first Omicron, for instance, there is issues with adaptive immunity. For instance, let's take the country of Portugal. As you can see here, there are high vaccination rates in Portugal, probably higher than there are in the United States. And despite good vaccination rates, of course, against the original virus, they are still seeing an increase in cases. Now, not hospitalizations necessarily, but cases in people in Portugal. This is despite very high vaccination rates. So you might say, well, that's because maybe vaccines aren't working so well. What we need is good herd immunity from infections. Well, there are high antibody rates, about 98% in South Africa. Remember, in South Africa, they really didn't get started until later in terms of antibodies from vaccines. Most of the antibody coverage early on, at least, was from previous infections. But even in this country, where there is a high antibody rate among the population, presumably from infections based on data, you still see an increase in cases. This means that whether you derive your adaptive immunity against the virus from previous infection or whether you derive it from vaccination, the spike protein of Omicron subvariant BA5 is different enough that it's going to escape, in many cases, this type of immunity. So what is going on in the United States? As you can see here, we're already shooting up in terms of BA5. 
in terms of new cases per 100,000 people. We're not nearly doing as much testing as we did, and we know that this is becoming more of an issue because the positivity rates on testing is going up. You can see here that there has been an overall decrease with the non-BA5 subvariants, but a sizable increase such that it is actually keeping the infection rate pretty constant. There is no decrease. BA5 is quickly replacing the types of subvariants for infection. What about around the world? Not just in cases. Let's talk about hospitalizations. Because one of the things that we've talked about with Omicron is that it seems to be a less severe variant than its predecessors like Delta or Gamma or Beta. So let's take a look at hospitalizations. So we're looking specifically here at hospitalizations. And in the United States, hospitalization rates have gone up overall since the beginning of April, but they're kind of holding steady. If we look at places like Portugal, hospitalization rates went up. South Africa, hospitalization rates went up. You can see here in the UK, they're starting to go up as well. And in many other parts of the world, specifically in Europe, we see in Austria, in the Netherlands, and in France, an increase in hospitalizations from Omicron. We also see in Israel, Germany, in Italy, not so much as in Spain, definitely in Belgium. And we don't know if we've reached the peak as yet. So of course it would seem as though the solution to this would be to get a BA5 vaccine or for people to become infected with BA5. Well, that's happening, no question about it. But the problem is, is that it takes so long to formulate the appropriate mRNA for the vaccine that by the time you get it out, that variant comes and goes. And so this is exactly the subject that Dr. Eric Topol from Scripps Institute was talking about when he wrote this in his article. He says, quote, should we wait for a BA5 booster? That'll take months. And it should be noted that it took more than seven months for the Omicron BA1 booster to be tested, a delay that is exceedingly long and unacceptable relative to the timing of validation and production of the original vaccines in 10 months during 2020. There is no right answer, but variant chasing is a flawed approach. By the time a BA5 vaccine booster is potentially available, who knows what will be the predominant strain? All this gets back to the vital need for a new generation of vaccines that are universal, that is variant-proof, either against all Sarbicoviruses or against all beta coronaviruses, and the pivotal importance of nasal vaccines to promote mucosal immunity and help block the transmission chain. These goals are paramount, along with more and better antiviral drugs, but they are not getting adequate traction or priority. And I think he's right. If you look at this, I mean, we keep doing the whack-a-mole game with different subvariants that change. Every single time we put pressure on one particular subvariant, another subvariant that is substantially different enough to escape is going to emerge. That has nothing to do with specifically vaccines because we're also seeing it for people with previous infections. What has been looked at before in terms of people who get multiple infections, which is becoming more and more likely as we look, is if we take the 30,000-foot view of the immune system, what we've done is we've concentrated here on the adaptive immune system. This is the part of the immune system that looks at antigens and develops B cells and T cells that fight specifically against those proteins. This is known as cell-mediated immunity and also antibody responses. So that type of process that we've been talking about with vaccines creating immunity not only against infection but also against disease falls specifically in the adaptive immune system. What I want to look at is the innate immune system because if we want to ask the question, why is it that people get infected multiple times in the first place versus some people who even to this day, and I've talked to one recently, they've gotten their antibodies tested and they are still negative. And the question is, is why are there a certain subsection of people that are still antibody negative? Is it that they've just been so lucky that they haven't gotten the infection? I've talked to people specifically who have gotten the vaccine, and as a result of that, they developed antibodies against the spike protein, but they've never developed antibodies against the core portion of the virus. In other words, the internal proteins that would only become available to the immune system if they were actually infected. And I believe, and the science is seeming to back this up, that a strong innate immune system is going to be one of the keys because this part of the immune system is the portion of the immune system that doesn't care what the variant is. 
the variant makes no difference because this part of the immune system finds the virus without having to have a specific spike protein. And so I think it's really important for us to sort of look at the innate immune system and try to figure out why this works and what we can do to boost it. Because as we'll show here shortly, there are some risks that are now associated with getting infected on a repeated basis. So we have known for some time that SARS-CoV-2 is very particular about what it does to the proteins in our body of the innate immune system. We've known this actually for some period of time. If we go back to 2020, this is what Nancy Goh wrote in an article titled, Interferon Responses Could Explain Susceptibility to Severe COVID-19. Quote, studies of SARS and MERS suggest that the interferon response is delayed. Compared with coronaviruses that cause mild disease, and with milder cases of these two coronaviruses that can cause severe disease, the patients with severe SARS or MERS had higher viral loads and delayed interferon responses. Thus, it could be that patients most susceptible to severe disease are those that cannot mount an effective early antiviral immune response. A study of 50 patients with cases ranging from mild to severe found that gene expression profiles indicating type 1 and type 2 interferon responses were highest in patients with mild to moderate disease and were low in patients with severe or critical disease. By the way, the interferon response is a response of the innate immune system. She goes on, a similar difference in type 1 interferon activity was detected in serum from the patients. Patients with more severe disease had less type 1 interferon activity in their blood. So it would stand to reason that if interferon response in the human body can dictate the severity of COVID-19, it may also be able to dictate whether or not one becomes infected as well. We can see here graphically, this was a paper that was published in Science, a very prestigious journal, that showed that in patients with mild disease, they had the highest interferon responses as opposed to those with critical disease, which had the least out of those that were positive. Also went on as well for interferon activity overall. A couple of other papers that were published as well looked at patients with mutations in their ability to secrete interferon, noticed that their interferon levels were extremely low, and in all of these patients, they had severe disease. In patients with antibodies against interferon, noticed that their interferon levels were almost universally low. All of these patients had severe COVID-19. So obviously it seems as though there is a genetic basis for why some people have elevated interferon responses and others don't. It might explain why certain families seem to get, quote, wiped out with COVID-19 and others seem to do better. There may be a genetic response, but we know that in many cases where there is a genetic response or a genetic predisposition to things, in this case interferon, there's also other factors. It's not 100% genetic. And the question that we've talked about many times here on MedCram is whether or not there are things that we can do that are very simple that can improve our innate immune system and specifically improve interferon response. And we've talked before about a number of studies that have looked at cytokines and whether or not we can improve that. One of the things that we looked at was whole body hyperthermia. We've talked about this when we talked about sauna use. We've talked about this when we've talked about hydrotherapy, heat baths, these sorts of things. And this was a study that was published over 20 years ago that showed in 12 healthy volunteers, when they were immersed in a hot bath of 39.5 degrees Celsius, that there was an increase in the innate immune system, specifically in monocytes and tumor necrosis factor, alpha. And in this case, the innate immune system was activated to better handle a bacterial challenge. But we've also seen that many people after a hot bath or hot shower will then go to a contrast shower and go to cold. And this study that was sponsored by the U.S. military and performed and conducted at the University of Toronto in Canada showed that a cold challenge after prior heating and exercise could also improve significantly the components of the innate immune system. In fact, what they showed here, even though there was only seven in each group, just seven subjects was able to show statistical significance, indicating that this was a strong response. 
They say here, quote, this study suggests that despite popular beliefs that cold exposure can precipitate a viral infection, the innate component of the immune system is not adversely affected by a brief period of cold exposure. Indeed, the opposite seems to be the case. The fall in core body temperature resulting from cold exposure led to a consistent and statistically significant mobilization of circulating cells, an increase in natural killer cell activity, and elevations in circulating IL-6 concentrations. And of course, we've talked about this study before as well, titled Hyperthermia in Humans Enhances Interferon Synthesis and Alters the Peripheral Lymphocyte Population. What they showed here was that when they took lymphocytes out of the human body at 39 degrees Celsius, which is about 102 degrees Fahrenheit, there was 10 times more secretion of gamma interferon at that temperature than there was before this. Remember again, gamma interferon is a product of the innate immune system. And data like this suggests that treating a fever is not such a great idea when you have a fever, unless of course it's causing significant problems with fast heart rates, etc. And maybe it would suggest that treating patients who have viral infections with contrast showers or hot baths or sauna baths like we used to do 100, 200 years ago may not be a bad idea. Now, it would be nice to get some randomized placebo-controlled trial data in COVID-19. We don't seem to have a paucity of cases, so I think this is something that would be worthwhile testing. The other thing that I would mention at this time of the year, as the days now of summer are getting shorter and shorter, is the idea of sunlight. Now, we've talked about this before, especially in our lecture, Light as Medicine, and we've also talked about this before as to why some people get repeated COVID-19 infections, and I'd refer you to that video as well. But there's this interesting article that was published in Nature, which we've talked about, and it looks at the autumn COVID-19 surge dates in Europe and what it seemed to correlate to. So there's been a lot of question as to why do these surges in the wintertime particularly occur, and what is it that is causing them? A number of people said, well, it's the temperature. It's the fact that the temperature is going down that is causing a problem with the immune system. Well, of course, we've just discussed that necessarily cold temperatures don't always cause a decrease in the immune system. Other people have said, well, it's the humidity. It's the humidity that is causing the virus to be able to transmit better. And other people have argued, no, it may be the latitude. The fact that there is less hours of daylight the more north that you go. And this becomes exacerbated in the wintertime because there's less light all around. So let's take a look. When we looked at the inflation date, in other words, what was the date that the inflation of cases started, we find that there was absolutely no correlation to temperature, that there was no correlation to humidity. But we see this amazing correspondence to latitude with the first spikes of COVID-19 in the wintertime starting in Finland and then finally ending up later in Greece at the bottom of Europe. And the question is, is, could this be through vitamin D? Well, we know that vitamin D is associated with better outcomes in COVID-19. But we also know that there's some other things that are causing morbidity, specifically obesity, diabetes. And how is this related? How is this tied in? So let's go back to basics once again. We know that angiotensin 2 is converted into angiotensin 1-7. That's important to know because angiotensin 2 is a pro-oxidant. It causes oxidative stress in the cells, and it gets converted into something that does the opposite, which is angiotensin 1-7. And the thing that does that is the ACE2 protein, which also acts as a receptor for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And that's important to understand because ACE2 is going to balance out the oxidative stress in your body. We know that because angiotensin 2 is a pro-oxidant and increases the risk of reactive oxygen species in the cell. Whereas angiotensin 1-7, red arrow, puts the brakes on reactive oxygen species. We don't like reactive oxygen species. These things lead to mitochondrial damage, oxidative stress, diabetes, dementia, these sorts of things. Obviously, when you have SARS-CoV-2 knocking out your ACE2 protein, which is causing this conversion, that is going to cause a major increase in reactive oxygen species. Not only that, but the infection is going to recruit white blood cells, which is also going to increase reactive oxygen species. 
And when you have increased reactive oxygen species, especially in the endothelial lining of your blood vessels, when those blood vessels get damaged, blood clots occur. And if those blood clots happen to be in the pulmonary vasculature, which is the blood clots that cause embolism, which is the blood clots that causes hypoxemia, which are the blood clots that get people on ventilators, this is potentially the issue what we see with COVID-19. How can we reduce the amount of reactive oxygen species? Well, we know that the pineal gland secretes melatonin. That happens at night. That is actually one way of dampening down reactive oxygen species. But there is another way we have discussed before that may reduce reactive oxygen species as well, and that is through near-infrared radiation coming from the sun. And 20 times the amount of melatonin is produced in the mitochondria right where it's needed to deal with these reactive oxygen species and hopefully prevent blood clots and hypoxemia. Is it possible that sunlight and those places that have more sunlight may be beneficial at getting rid of blood clots and hypoxemia? Now, in case you think that this might be a far-fetched theory, there's actually some data behind this. This was a study that was published in December of 2021, and they looked at 60 patients, and they looked at measures of reactive oxygen species. And we've looked at this before, so let's go through it quickly. What they found was that intracellular glutathione was reduced as you get older and reduced specifically if you got COVID. And so that would show not only COVID, but older age was associated with more reactive oxygen species. When they looked at oxidative stress particularly, again, what did they see? That as you get older, oxidative stress necessarily goes up, and that puts you at risk. But when you had COVID, it was higher in those patients. And finally, a measure of oxidative damage itself. Once again, that as you go older, there is more oxidative damage that is occurring. But at each one of these points, those that had COVID had more oxidative damage. So when a group of scientists at the University of Edinburgh decided to look at the relation of latitude to mortality in COVID-19, they looked at the United States and they eliminated the portion of the United States in the wintertime that could get enough vitamin D from the sun. And they just looked at the areas that could never get enough vitamin D. So in other words, they wanted to look at sunshine without the effect of vitamin D. And they still found in this situation that as people got more and more light, in other words, as latitude decreased, the COVID-19 deaths went down. Same thing happened in England. As more and more sunshine came in, COVID-19 deaths went down. In Italy, prospectively, as sunshine went up, COVID-19 deaths went down. So the authors concluded that this study is observational, and therefore any causal interpretation needs to be taken with caution. However, if the relationship identified proves to be causal, it suggests that optimizing sun exposure may be a possible public health intervention. Given that the effect appears independent of a vitamin D pathway, it suggests possible new COVID-19 therapies. And of course, they've been doing this for years, getting people outside. And that's exactly what I would recommend doing, especially as we are nearing towards December and the daylight hours are reducing. And the reason why I would do this is you don't want to get repeated infections. That's important to understand because Omicron subvariant BA5 seems to be less responsive to previous vaccination and previous infections. And actually, there is some data that is indicating that repeated infections with SARS-CoV-2 can lead to increased risks of morbidity and mortality. There was a study, and I'll put a link to this in the description below. This was a VA study here in the United States. It looked over at least five plus million charts. And the question was, do people who have had multiple infections have higher risks of death and complications than those that have only had one infection? So they looked at people who had zero infections, one, two, three, or four plus infections. And in terms of numbers, they had about 5.3 million people who have never had an infection in terms of their data bank. They had about 257,000 who had one SARS-CoV-2 infection. 
Then they had those that had what they termed as multiple infections. And for that, there was about 39,000 of those. And specifically, if we look at the different subtypes, 2, 3, and 4 plus, those that had 2 were at 36,000. Those that had 3 infections were at 2.2 thousand. And those that had 4 plus, believe it or not, there was 246 of them. And there were three categories that they looked at. They looked at mortality, they looked at hospitalizations, and they looked at sequela. And sequela would mean, for instance, blood clots or fatigue, cardiovascular complications, GI, kidney, mental health, diabetes, musculoskeletal, neurological, these sort of sequela. And they go into more detail in the article, but I wanted to sort of look at that as a whole. And what they found was that when we looked at mortality and we looked at those that had repeated infections versus those that just had one infection, there was an increase in mortality of 2.14-fold. When we looked at hospitalizations, the risk there was 2.83-fold. And when we looked at sequela, there was an increase of 1.82-fold. Now, when you translate that into the burden per thousand over a six-month period, the corresponding number there for mortality was 23.8 people per 1,000 six months. For hospitalizations, it was 95.5 per thousand in six months. And for sequela, it was 196 per thousand over a six-month period of time. When they looked at sequela and they asked, well, does it get worse with repeated infections? The answer was yes. So specifically in terms of sequela, if we look at zero infections, what was the likelihood of sequela if someone had one infection? It was 1.35 times the risk. For two, it was 2.11 times the risk. And for three, it was 3.0 times the risk. They did not have enough data for 4 plus. Please know that this research has not yet been published or peer reviewed. I do believe it is important that our adaptive immune system is developed well, whether it is infection or adaptive immunity from vaccination, and make sure that we've had our booster shots to improve our outcomes, because that still shows even today that good adaptive immunity is going to help in terms of hospitalization. I think we also need to focus on making sure that our innate immune system is revved up as well. And that means getting outside, getting good sun exposure. Doesn't have to be direct sunlight, but just getting outside, making sure that we're getting lots of sleep and lots of rest, exposing our eyes to bright light in the morning and turning down the lights at night after nine o'clock. As we head into the fall, I think we are going to see increasing infections. And if we want to make sure that we stay safe, we need to follow these sound rules of engagement. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications and join us at medcram.com.